Welcome to this Aritco talk focusing on the future of the office. Workplaces in the future, yes. As a hybrid approach to ways of working, what innovations, what new technologies, what kind of sustainability will we see in the future workplaces? This is a series of talks hosted by Aritco on this very interesting topic. Uh, how sustainability and technology can merge into the future ways of living. My name is Lee Pump and I'm today's moderator and I will now introduce to you the excellent panel. Starting with uh, London. Welcome Jessica Christine Hampner. You're with us from London. Hi. 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 Thank you for having me here today. You are the editor of On Office magazine, which is a leading publication focusing on cutting edge workplace design, among other things. And uh, you also contribute to, to other titles such as uh, We Heart, Frame and Design magazine. And you have previously been on, on, uh, as a contributor to also to Wallpaper magazine. Yes. We're <laughs> so you. happy to have you, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much. Welcome. And with us also from the UK, uh, James Bidwell, welcome. Hello, lovely to be here. <laughs> welcome back. You are uh, the co-founder of Reset, and Reset is a leading strategy consultancy of innovation and sustainability. You have a guideline, tell me. Well, we have a mission. Um, we want to create as much positive change as possible. Um, and our, our strap line is create a better future today because we're in a hurry. We're in a hurry, certainly. And you are also the owner and chairman of Springwise, we should add to this presentation. We're so happy to have you also, James. And with me? It's lovely to be back. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And with me here in Stockholm, David Schill. You're the marketing director of Aritko Lifts. Yes, that's right. Thank Gr you. Great to see you. Thank you so much. How is the lift industry? Uh, the lift industry is uplifting as always, I assume. <laughs> yeah. I expected that answer. Ah, <laughs> now, I, by now. now I will expect another kind of answer because today's topic, we have already presented it, is going to have uh, a lot to do with you know, future works, workspaces, the, the role of offices and how we work in the, in the near future and maybe also in the longer term. So my first question as we hopefully now are entering the post-COVID era, will the workplaces be the same again? Will we go back? Can we go back? Jessica, what do you say? I do think we will go back, but I don't think we will go back to the same office or the office as we've known it. Um, so I think the pandemic has really you know, brought about many changes that has caused us to question um, our work and the role of the office. Uh, so I do think we'll be going back to a new office. And James, what is your... Yeah, I, I agree with Jessica. I don't think we're going to go back to way, how we were. I think that um, there will be many changes um, that we will see over the next coming years, actually. I don't think it'll be just flicking a switch. It'll be up post-COVID and we all sort of go back to a steady state. I think there's huge amounts of opportunity and change to come. And the relationship we have with the place of work and the place of home has changed irrevocably uh, during the pandemic time. And David, can we go back? Of course we will go back. Uh, the new offices, as Jessica mentioned, will have a new role. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it also sets new demands. So it's uh, like uh, James says, uh, it won't happen overnight uh, with all the different new demands that we need to put on our offices and ways of living. Uh, nothing will be the same. What, what do you, would you say is the most important insight that we have made during this year of pandemic? Fr from uh, uh, our point of view, both as a company and, uh, and also as an individual and, uh, and ways of working, what you follow in society, I think what, what actually creates, uh, which is astonishing, I think is and remarkable how fast we adjust to new ways uh, of, of ways of living, ways of working, and we adjust to, to certain differences or, or changes in, in the world super quickly. What, what would you then say is the COVID-19 driven behaviors that we will for sure keep 
as we enter this new era? I think uh, from uh, uh, from a world citizen point, I think we will uh, have a, a way of living that uh, more or less uh, keeps us better in balance in many ways. We, we have new values uh, or we have at least brought up another balance between different values. We value, uh, we value things in a different way. Uh, I think that uh, uh, is one way. Uh, I think we have also evoked a lot of new problems that we, uh, we have revealed that we uh, will need to challenge. Uh, one, uh, one problem I think I is the urbanization, but the yeah, urbanization... Yeah, but I was, I, was, I was more thinking of okay. behavior wise. James, Jessica, what do you say? What, what behaviors will we for sure keep? Jessica, you go. I was thinking around uh, mental health and well-being. I think those needs will continue to increase. Um, the pandemic has highlighted a range of mental health responses caused by the current crisis, such as grief and loneliness and depression. So I think the well-being of employees is very important right now. Um, so I think perhaps in the future, um, we'll see employers incorporating more wellness strategies such as different kind of relaxation rooms and biophilic design. And um, at least that's one of the behaviors I think that will continue seeing that people will put their health first. And I, I could add to that, Lee, if I may, that, um, you know, I think the first thing that will go is the long commute, <laughs> the daily long commute. You know, the train companies across Europe have you know, suddenly found that there's no, luckily no one sitting on those crowded trains in the morning. And I think that will be something that um, will get lost and it'll be, we will com commute in different ways and the train services will change their way that they, they um, charge in order to do that. But to David's point, we're all human and that connectivity and the importance of the, of the new workplace in, in um, responding to behavioral change is going to be fascinating because there is such an opportunity for offices and workplaces to be sensational places to meet mm. and to engage, but in a completely different way. It, it's, it's been a year or soon a year and a half. Um, what data do we have from, I mean, a, a very important question in, the, in this is of course, where do we work best? From where do we work best, and what what do we actually know about this? Are there any figures that have measured this uh, that are reliable? What what do you say? What do you know about this? Where do we work best? I think there are plenty of studies uh, coming out, uh, lots of views, uh, sometimes opposite views. So so I think there are more. Uh, there is a large need to get more data on this. Uh, uh, but but, but uh, I just uh, read a uh, um, study from the, the, the agency Leesman in, in, in UK and, and where they have interviewed 125,000 people that, that most of them actually think it is quite nice to work from home. Yeah, nice but is one thing. Yeah, but and, <laughs> and it works. Yeah. And, and this is yeah. exactly what, what they say. It works. But the spread between those who actually think it's fantastic and those who think that it is, it's awful is extremely wide. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, and, and in here you can see that the ones that don't like it, they do, uh, wha uh, most of them don't have a proper workplace at home. Hmm. So one third of the uh, uh, of uh, the people in the study does not have a proper workplace, and of course, that puts new demands. If this is going to continue, and this symbiosis with the office and the home office wi will uh, will continue, that puts us in totally new demands. Mm. For instance, uh, uh, Jessica or James, do you have any data or any figures regarding this or regarding productivity uh, the past year? I, I personally, I came across um, two. So in terms of where people work better, um, I found that on average, those who work from home uh, spend 10 minutes less a day being unproductive and they work one more day a week and in total are 47% more productive. Um, but at the same time, as we've kind of already touched on, sometimes the data that 
or the studies that I've found are very conflicting. Um, so it's difficult to, I would say, draw a direct conclusion, but um, it's very interesting. I think in terms of productivity, people seem to be very productive at home. Is there not- And so I don't have specific data, Lee, but what we, what I think is interesting is that data will be very important, but there will be a highly complicated debate about privacy and, you know, do we want to share our data of when we're most productive with our, with our workplace? And, you know, there is already with, within, you know, coming out of COVID, there is a feeling that the state has become, you know, very powerful and we're all told to lock down and all of that. And I think employers need to, at their peril, um, start to monitor every single bit of moment of productivity for, for teams. So I think, um, again, that comes back to creating places where people can be happy. And if you're happy, you're productive, right? And, and of course, there are metrics for success in business, but I don't think we're automated workers yet, which is a relief. I mean, while people who choose to stay at home, maybe they continue this, let's say, good pace of productivity. And, and those who transform back to the offices, uh, how do we meet this challenge to, to get them together again? And maybe the decline? Um, I think, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Please, Jessica. Sorry? Go ahead. You go. Oh, um, I think it's perhaps um, about finding a balance. We need the office for collaboration, but at the same time, I think we need quiet spaces such as a home for focused work. Um, like you've pointed out, I think there is a risk that people perhaps won't be as productive when they return to the office. Um, so maybe we really need to ask ourselves, why are we bringing people back to the office? Kind of what, what are we hoping to gain by that? Um, so I think for people to want to leave their home, we probably have to make the office uh, or offices in general a lot more enticing to come back to. Um, as kind of James pointed out already, they have to be great spaces that cater to different needs that people will actually want to return to the office. Yeah, so let's let's talk about these spaces then, because if the office is in transformation, towards what do you see the offices, the corporate offices transform? James, you, I guess you have some ideas on this. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the opportunity uh, um, is that offices do need to transform in, and and as Jessica was saying, this idea of of a meeting place and a place to collaborate. Um, I mean, our business is you know we work we co-create sustainability and innovation strategies with our partners, and um, you know the big set piece meetings need to be in an amazing space to get the creative juices going and all of that. So we we would work in somewhere like Somerset House, where we have our, our, our office to do those big events, but we wouldn't necessarily need everyone in an office at sitting at a desk in a kind of an old fashioned way um, every single day, because, you know, if someone wants to work at home or they've got to look after their kids, you know, for a part of the day, and want to get up early. I think the other part of this debate, everyone's needs are different. So, so where is the common ground and the common ground where you can have maximum impact to, to build culture, to build team, to check in on well-being and all of those things. The office needs to be that very accessible but very special place. And I think, you know, there's no laziness in office design now. This has to be really somewhere that people want to come rather than they feel they have to come. And how can you then optimize design uh, as a tool or a... Something to to make this new office. Uh. Here, I think this is the is a huge uh, uh, how should I say challenge uh, for all architect agencies, designers, and and facility companies as well as property owners. How do you quite quickly now? Uh, to be attractive, uh, both as a, a employer as well as a property owner and facility maker. Uh, how how do you make yourself available to meet the needs? Not only the functional needs out of uh, it needs to be ergonomic, it needs to have the technology itself. It needs to, uh, but suddenly it needs to be inspiring. It needs to meet the company values. Suddenly, this has become a new arena for companies to build their own uh, employer brand. Uh, 
uh, as well as the, the, the commercial brand, of course, because here there are a lot of things going to happen. And this must be, a, a, as you both recall, Jessica and James, this must be a really interesting arena to actually be able to, to come to. It should be tempting to really, I would love to go there. Uh, uh, because uh, we forget a little bit about the productivity. The productivity sometimes just counts in, in what we produce. But what are the circumstances? What are the foundation for being able to produce? And uh, I think here, the company arena in the future, the office arena, will really make the big difference. So it, it seems like you are all talking into terms of that the the corporate office will have a role of being a hub for socializing for uh, workshops for idea making and well-being jessica and uh, the home office will then be something more introvert concentrating personally um i think so i think that the traditional office kind of as we've known it or the headquarters will be the heart of a company somewhere where people can come to collaborate and connect but also connect with the company culture um, i guess one of the problems or challenges that we found working from home is how do you keep employees connected to the company culture and vision um, so to have that hub where people can come and collaborate and talk about future ideas um, will be very beneficial, whereas the home, like you've pointed out, can easily be um, used for focused work, things where we don't necessarily have to collaborate. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how, how I personally would see it. And, and I could add to that, um, which is a slightly different point, but around this idea of sustainability and sustainability in design. And we're finding as we create strategies for modern next generation companies that they want sustainability as part of their purpose, part of their values. And therefore, office designers need to be thinking about that and embedding sustainability into the design. I do think there will be a moment when people come to the office and they want to ask, they will ask, you know, how is this building heated? How is this building cooled? How, what is this building made of? And that is not far away um, as the pace of change accelerates. And therefore, what is exciting is that design and the building in the kind of uh, that circularity, if you like, uh, um, building in all of this to the design, I think, will shape corporate op offices going forward. Um, and as you say, the role of a home or a, an office office will be will be different. Do you also think that you will build in a sanitary details i mean connected to the covid-19 experience will we see innovations connected to 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 anti antibacterial buttons or whatever what what do you say what's your forecast am i going, I, I can do that because we did this we we created with um aritco this fantastic report on innovation um going forward and um there are some fantastic ideas in there, which we which we sourced via the Springwise network around sanitization built into shelves, so you can have that built in rather than having the squeezy bottle. Amazing air quality and circulation um, innovations, which allow you to use uh, kind of pictures on the wall to purify your to purify your air. Of course, there's the the living wall idea, which is has been pioneered. Um, and, and as we go through a, a transition effectively from fossil fuel energy to uh, a kind of more renewable energy, I think there will be um, other ways where those things can be brought to life. And of course, um, already we're seeing, um, in, if you get into a, a lift, you, have, um, you can have contactless lift buttons just as a simple thing. But of course, in a, in a world where we're all washing our hands, and I think we will continue to be quite scared and the pandemic is probably not completely over. Uh, even, you know, and uh, we can see what's happening around the world. So I think we, that's going to be with us. So that kind of innovation and innovative thinking is absolutely what we're going to see more and more of. And the acceleration in that across the Springwise network in the last year has been extraordinary. What, what do you say? Uh, this is the corporate office. Um, since we are apparently spending more and more time also in the home office, what would you say is the employers responsibility when it comes to ergonomic working situations and for, for the individual at home how far shall we as employers 
stretches? I think this is going to be the big challenge. Uh, if you just uh, relate my, the topic to the Lehman's, uh, Lehman's uh, a a analysis that they made uh, and uh, understanding that one third of, of, of us don't have a proper working station. And this is something that will go on in a new way of, of, of working. Uh, at least for most countries, this is a must uh, where the actually employer take the responsibility much, much further than during the COVID, mm. uh, which means that these are the, it's not an, just an office office investment and change that is needed. You also need as an employer uh, uh, offer the home office solution for the future. Yeah. And many companies then I know uh, relating to both Spotify here in Stockholm as well as Ericsson here in Stockholm are now making different types of programs where people can individualize their choice mm. in different ways of how do I work from home, how do I work at the office. But Suddenly, that also means that at the office office, we need to make sure that everything is accessible for everybody. Mm. Uh, speaking about lifts and, li uh, and what lifts can play as a role in, in, in the future offices when they become the meeting places as such. Mm. And Jessica, I know that you're, you are very interested in, in the health aspect of this. Um, these, I guess, new investments as employers make in their employees by maybe buying better ergonomic chairs for their home offices or whatever is that would would you say that there is that is a, a clearly mm, investment that will pay off or is it a danger in in meeting two individualistic needs there is slightly i guess there's somewhat of a danger um but at the same time there are some people who simply don't have the space um, for, you know, for proper setup. So I guess to help um, or provide support in some ways would be beneficial to avoid people, you know, working from sofas and perhaps, you know, developing back problems. Um, so I think in the long term, it, it does pay off. Um, I think that, um, as we've kind of touched on already, Facebook, Twitter and Shopify actually paid remote workers $1,000 um, to help them set up new home offices. So I guess, yes, there is a danger, um, you know, catering to too many needs, but at the same time, um, for those who don't have the necessary, you know, chairs and tables, uh, it is increasingly important. And what an opportunity for designers because most people don't want to have ugly furniture, a big desk in their living yeah. room, and here are multi-purpose furnitures, heaven in the future. Yeah, imagine mm. a, a great chair. Nobody yeah. has ever invented a great ergonomic <laughs> <laughs> office chair, yeah, true. design wise. <laughs> foldable uh, uh, desks, foldable. There are so many, yeah. of course, already out there, very new and beautiful furniture that have these multi-purposes. Uh, but uh, I think th that is only an area that will grow a lot. If we allow us to zoom out a few seconds, uh, James, you 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 were heading that in the in the very start that fewer people are now commuting, and and that is a direct effect that we now will continue that. What will happen to the urban structure? What will happen to retail connected to our offices? If we talk about the cities, what do you see there? James. So I can see a very, I can see a utopian vision, which may take a bit of time, but, you know, a cities without cars, first mm. of all, which will free up an enormous amount of space. Um, cities where you can do everything within 15 minutes, there's, there's pilots around the 15 minute city happening, and cities where we grow our food, there is a massive um, regeneration opportunity um, and localizing supply chains, um, which again fit with the sustainability agenda. So I think um, there's so many things that, that should happen. Now, how fast they will happen. I think cars in London, they spend 92% of their time unused. So imagine all that space um, that could be freed up and turned into beautiful um, kind of grass and places for kids. And again, you know, although the office is generally inside, but what about the outside? What about the environment around 
What about the natural environment? What about bringing nature in? All of those things, in spite of it always raining in the UK by the, by the, the feel of things, you know, being in nature is so powerful and so precious. And Jessica, what, what do you say about this? What, what, what do you see in the urban structure? Um, I completely agree um, with what James has said. I think, you know, we've seen a huge shift, at least here in the UK, um, you know, people leaving bigger cities during the pandemic for the countryside. And that's really just a trend that's been accelerated by the pandemic. I think even before with, you know, the digital revolution, people being able to work from anywhere and with rising rents, people were looking for alternative places to live and work from. And I think that will only continue. And obviously that will hugely change our cities. Um, but I'd also like to see, I think, car-free cities um, encouraging I think also safer cycle paths and um, especially in London and again that would help with overcrowding and um, it would be better for the planet but also people's health because it would keep them fit um, so a, really a focus on greener spaces and safer spaces as well. It, it seems like you all all three of you see a very positive development in all this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with uh, both James and Jessica in terms of I see the cities, for instance, in a very positive change. Uh, because the population of the world is still growing. Yeah, uh, uh, and I think <laughs> here is the conflict I I in this. And uh, I know that we have touched it on previous talks too. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I agree with Jessica. We see the trend of people moving out of the cities, but not all of us. Uh, not all of the population in the city have the advantage or have the means to actually buy something outside uh, on the countryside. And not even in Sweden with loads of space, everybody can have a piece of land and grow their own groceries, etc. etc. So we need to solve the urbanization. Uh, that because that is a much bigger problem and if we don't do that we still are in a uh, very poor situation and, uh, and which I know that James also have looked into in, in if this not happen in a short time we will end up in a very poor situation so we need to, to find new ways in the cities where exactly no cars where we have maybe uh, Maybe your home space is too small, but you have a common space together with your neighbors as your working place instead of going to the office. Maybe it's four spaces at the cafe that someone is offering in, instead of going to the office. Does it have to be in your home when you only have 25 square meters? For me, the big issue is we are in a climate crisis. We have, you know, seven, 10 years to um, before we hit the tipping point according to David Attenborough's new fantastic um, exposition. And um, we need to address it. And uh, the worst thing that can happen in, in business life is that every, all the executives get back on the plane and you know hurtle around the globe in their offices in the sky, which of course have been designed by the aeroplane people to be offices in the sky. And you know, do that, in, which which you know, and kick out um, masses of emissions and all of those things. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't believe that travel is is not a fantastically important cultural, um, you know, and and business tool. But but we just need to think in a different way and be agile and innovative and creative and address the issues, both environmental and social, because we haven't spoken so much about the social issues, but there are many social issues, and humanity is. Um, at a bit of a tipping point at the moment. I think we have to make some decisions and whether we can remains to be seen. I think just to add on that really that, you know, last year when the world stood still, the carbon emissions did fall, but not as much, I think, as many people have expected them to fall. And it just really shows what we've already saying, how desperately we need to make changes and reevaluate the way we live and work and where we live and work and what is really important. Um, so I think, you know, the pandemic has been incredibly challenging and, and difficult, but I'm hopeful that perhaps it also allows us to do things better and to move forward in a more positive way. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all three of you participating in this discussion Thank focusing you. focusing on the future role of our workplaces. And 
it seems like we're having a very exciting future. Thank you very much. Jessica Christine Hampner, thank you. And James thank you. Bidwell, thank you. And David Schill, thank you. And all of you who have watched this panel, thank you.